I am slap bang in the middle of nowhere. I really am right in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I've got Perth about 600 kilometres in that direction, Brisbane's about 4,000 in that direction, and Darwin's about the same over there. The most interesting thing about where I am is a hole in the ground. Mind you, it's not just any old hole in the ground. Hole in the ground. Hole in the ground. <laughs> decided to kick off my long journey out west in Kalgoorlie. Starting at the super pit and finishing down in infamous Hay Street. I'm off to an early opener to meet some late drinkers. Well, these are the ashes of three guys who used to drink here. Ashes? Ashes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll talk to a mob about the failure of Aurelia. Come on, what is your word? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and is this the hottest little whorehouse in Kalgoorlie? They've actually melted together from the heat. Wow. This hole is the biggest gold-producing mine in the country. Used to be lots of different holes. Individuals had bought loads of different leases and they would burrow down looking for gold. But in the 1980s, they bought out all those leases and turned it into this one huge gash in the ground in order to make sure that none of the gold was lost. How huge? Well, if the Great Flood ever hit Kalgoorlie, not very likely, I know, but stay with me here, it would take the equivalent of more than five Sydney harbours to fill the pit. This is the bucket from one of the diggers that they use. Hi, kids. Imagine how many kids you could fit in that bucket. And it operates 24 hours a day. At the moment, they're extracting something like 850,000 ounces a year, which financially is in the neighbourhood of about $1.3 billion. And that's my kind of neighbourhood. The pit was predicted to run out by 2018. Now it could be 2021. No one's really sure. But one thing is for certain. All around me is one zonking great stream of gold. Of course, it's not the only thing around me. Gold attracts miners, and miners create towns. Kalgoorlie's full name is Kalgoorlie Boulder, because there used to be two towns here. One was called Kalgoorlie, and the other was Boulder. And the most celebrated pub in the whole of Boulder has got to be this one, the Metropole. One second. Hi, mate. Pull up a stamp. Thank you. Just a small bit. Sure. So what's the difference between Boulder and Kalgoorlie? Well, the gold's in Boulder. Kalgoorlie just rides on the back of Boulder. Yeah? And that's the truth. The people of Boulder were obsessed by gold, weren't they? But not only gold, by, by beer as well. Because if you didn't have enough beer to drink, you'd probably die of thirst, wouldn't you? There's bugger all water about in, in those days. Well, it was cheaper to bath in champagne than it was in water. That was really true. It's true. True story. Extraordinary. Well, this notion of being obsessed by booze uh, and by gold continues to this very day. Um, not that it affects either of the, these guys, of course, but... <laughs> you, look, you order your drink here now in the Metropole, right? And uh, while you're necking it down, you get your change. You drop it down there. Look, do you see that barrel down there that takes the change? What's it called? Kibble. What's that mean? <laughs> it's Aussie for buckets. That's made it all clear, isn't it? Thank, thank you very much. But what it shows you is where the old workings used to be, right under the hotel itself. Can we get down to those? You can. Can you show me how? Up this way, up here. Come on, then. I'll see you later. Kibble, did you know it's Aussie for buckets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in, Chewy. How old is this pub? Uh, built in 1898. So presumably that working underneath the glass must have been older than that. Well, yeah, probably around about 1890, perhaps. When did they find it again? Uh, around about 2000, I think. It was about then. 
Do you think there would have been many like this, or do you think there are still a lot like this under the ground here in Boulder? Well, Boulder is probably like a rabbit warren. Mm. There's tunnels and holes going everywhere. Presently, that's uh, down about 11 metres. Yeah. And uh, nobody knows where it goes from there. What are these three things down here? Well, these are the ashes of uh, three guys that used to drink here. Ashes? Ashes, yes. When the boys were cremated, they uh, requested their ashes to be laid to rest here at the Metropole. Who are the blokes? Uh, we've got Jack Woods in the urn. Yep. Jack was an old miner. The box is Mick Barrett, officially known locally as Duvalaki. He used to own a local second-hand furniture shop. And the other one was uh, was Neil Crispin. He's, um, he was a local lad here. And all these lads used to spend all their time, when they weren't work, at the pub. So they're still, even to this day, halfway between the booze and the gold. They are. They are. Very fitting. Shall we uh, keep that tradition alive and go back upstairs? We should. See you guys. A bucket is a kibble. You've learned something, haven't you? It's a short, well, fairly short, walk to Kalgoorlie, which used to be known as Hannon's, or Hannon's Find. I'm heading for the main drag, Hannon's Street. This is the bloke who started it all, Paddy Hannon. It's life-size, so he was a little bloke just like me. An Irishman obsessed by gold. He dug in New Zealand and New South Wales, South Australia. Now, here he was in 1893 in Western Australia, about 40 kilometres down the road in Coolgardie. And he and a couple of mates came up this way looking for gold, and they found enough on the surface to keep them in money for years. So he raced back to Coolgardie and announced what he'd found, and wow, everyone got really excited, and the Kalgoorlie gold rush started. But here he is, so we can pay homage to him. We actually can pay homage to him because this is uh, a water fountain, and if we want to say hello, we just go like that. Very nice. Thanks, mate. Paddy's gold rush gave birth to a very precocious child. Kalgoorlie was barely five years old when the locals started flexing some serious political muscle. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, in the late 1890s, there was a big kerfuffle in Western Australia about whether you guys should join all the other states of Australia in a federation, a brand new country of Australia, or whether you should stay as you've always been on your own, just the state of Western Australia. And those people who supported the idea of federation, will you uh, join us as part of the, uh, the, the federation? In you come. I suspect you don't really support federation anyway, but. <laughs> For, for this moment, you will be a federalist. A lot of you were miners who'd come from Eastern Australia and you wanted federation. What did you want? Federation. I'm sorry, what did you want? Federation. Come on, what did you want? Federation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Whereas on the other side, these people who didn't want federation, they were known as the gropers, the sand gropers, because you spent the whole day just groping around in the sand. You wanted to be on your own and you wanted, what, gold, I suppose? Definitely. Yeah. Gold and a separate state. Come on, you join them as well. What did you want? Sep Gold, Gold and a separate state. state. <laughs> no wonder they lost. What did, <laughs> what did you want? Gold, Gold and a separate state. state. I beg your pardon? Gold, Gold and a separate, separate state. state. And what did you want? <laughs> right, and you guys started getting a bit hacked off and you said, all right, all right, hang on a minute. You want your separate state? Well, we're going to have our separate state too. And it's going to be all the way around here. In other words, we'll have all the gold fields and we'll call our separate state Aurelia, which means gold. And once we've got it, we will then immediately federate. Faced with the prospect of losing a large and very wealthy chunk of the state, the government went into spin mode. Premier John Forrest suddenly turned all pro-federation. Well, he pretended, and he allowed women to vote, apparently believing they wouldn't want it anyway. Wrong. They had this referendum, and by 69%, 
What did they get? Federation! Exactly, and that is why you are still here today in a city without all those skyscrapers, without those great parks, without the fancy shops that you get in London, Paris, Rome, Melbourne and Sydney. But instead, you've got Kalgoorlie, haven't you? You're lucky to be where you are, aren't oh, you? Oh, very lucky. We've got the best bushland in the world. We've got, you know, unique flora and fauna. We've got beautiful walks. We're, we're very, very lucky. Brilliant. Fantastic. Give him a big hand. <laughs> for Western Australia. For Aurelia. <laughs> they said, go west, young man. But this old bloke took his place and headed for the golden city of Kalgoorlie. I've swapped yarns over beers in the pub, paid homage to a town founder and relived an economic rebellion. Let's face it, I'm a historical King Midas. But gold isn't the only precious commodity here. In 1903, Kalgoorlie was given a lifeline by Charles O'Connor, the state's chief engineer, who six years earlier had built Fremantle Harbour. His plan was a water pipe, but not just any old water pipe. This was going to be a massive pipeline going all the way from Perth right through to Kalgoorlie. A really audacious piece of engineering, 566 kilometres, and it would cost a fortune. They were going to have to borrow two and a half million pounds from London in order to get the money to build it. But nevertheless, after five years of trouble and strife and arguments, it finally reached Kalgoorlie, the tap was turned on, and the town, at last, had its own fresh water. But the celebrations on January the 24th, 1903, were tinged with sadness. So, Mike, there was one person who wasn't here who should have been, wasn't there? There was, yes. My great-grandfather, Charles Yelverton O'Connor, the chief engineer of West Australia. And he wasn't here because...? He killed himself ten months before the water arrived. Why was that? Well, it was the, the real stress of the job had really finally got to him. And a month before the Sunday Times, there was an article in which it mentioned words like corruption and this shire engineer and greasing his palm, and all those sort of things he knew were wrong. So why did they think that? Well, mainly because it's a huge project and no one really understands it. The harbour went quickly, how come the pipeline is, isn't going as quickly? And so they start looking at, at reasons. The first story was, you know, the cement isn't good enough, but it'll come down and Perth will be flooded, and then the pipes, are, you know, the quality is inferior, and any intelligent person, including the chief engineer, could see that said one anonymous source. So he had all this sort of pressure going on. And none of this is true? None of this is true. In fact, after he died, very soon afterwards, when they, when they looked at his books, they found out he had less than 200 quid to his name. He never owned property. I mean, he had a big family, he had seven kids, but he would be very cautious about going out and mixing with people in case it was seen as uh, he was greasing his own palm, which he never did. You know, the, the sad thing is that within months of him dying, all that criticism disappeared. Thankfully, his pipeline hasn't. It sits proudly alongside the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme and the Sydney Harbour Bridge as civil engineering works that profoundly changed Australia. Right, time to head for town. But which town? All right, it's called Tony Robinson's Time Walks and I'm getting in a car. So sue me under the Trade Practices Act. You'll see why in a minute. I'm taking a drive about 20 kilometres up the road to a place called Canowna. Like Kalgoorlie, it sprang up in 1893 when alluvial gold was discovered. Unlike Kalgoorlie, pretty soon the gold was drying up and the town's future with it. And that is where Father Long came in. He was a local Catholic priest who said he'd been shown a gold nugget so big 
He called it the sacred nugget. And what is more, he knew where it had been found, although he'd been sworn to secrecy. So did that mean that Kanauna's fortunes were now on the turn? Certainly a lot of miners got very excited about it and wanted to know where it was. So eventually, Father Long said he would tell them. And he went to a local hotel and he stood on a veranda with them all crowded around him. But when he started to speak, what he said was so vague that pretty soon the miners realised that he'd no idea of the location of this nugget. Either Father Long was hoaxing them or else someone else had hoaxed Father Long and they got very angry and said they were going to burn the town down. They didn't, but what I find so interesting about the story 100 years on is this. We have managed to find a photo of all the miners gathering round to hear what Father Long had got to say. Look at the size of that crowd and the size of the hotel. And now all that's left of it is that. At its peak, Kanauna had 6,000 people, nine pubs, two breweries, and an hourly train service to Kalgoorlie. For the last 60 years, it's been scrub, dust, flies, and fading memories of a gold town that didn't quite make it. Funny, isn't it? The fine line between Kalgoorlie's success and Kanauna's failure is about 20 kilometres. Still out here, everything seems bigger than usual. I've just seen the most ridiculous thing I've ever come across in my entire travels. Look, I, I understand the world's biggest marina or the tallest skyscraper or the oldest bridge or whatever, but the world's tallest rubbish bin. Look. Just doesn't make any sense, does it? Chuck it in the bin, will you? I don't know. Maybe it's Kalgoorlie's odd sense of humour. You get a lot of it in frontier towns. In the old days, there were 14 pubs along Hannon Street. And if a newcomer came to town, the old guys would wind them up by making a bet with them. Do you know about this bet? No, I don't. I'll tell you. The bet was, you went to pub one and you had to drink a teaspoon of beer. Then pub two, two teaspoons and so on and so on and so on. And if you could keep doubling up up to pub 14, then you won the bet. That sounds easy. It does sound easy, doesn't it? Yes. But I have 50 bucks here that says you can't do that. Oh, I'll match your 50. Yeah? Done. What's your name? Neville. Right, Neville. Uh, Bailey, have you got a spoon? Yes. Maybe we'll borrow it for it. A okay, you so you are in pub number one. Yes. And here we go. Easy. Pub two. Pub My three. My going to kill me. <laughs> pub number four is eight of these. Just to speed things up, mm -hmm. I'll just tip it into another one for the moment. Whoops, that's one ounce. Yep. Pub five, two ounces. Pub six, four. Up seven, eight ounces, which is an entire glass of beer. All right. Very nice. Thank you. Very, Very nice. refreshing. Yeah. Uh, pub number eight, you've got two. Bailey, could you get four glasses out for pub number nine? Thank you. And eight for pub number ten. Pub. 11, 16, and pub 12, 32, 13, 64. By the time you get to pub 14, you have got to drink, at that pub alone, 128 glasses for the final pub. I think I need some friends to help me. I think you were. <laughs> in fact, I think you've lost that pair, haven't you? I think you? you're right. Uh, but you've learned something today. Yes, I you? have. Thank you very much, that Bailey. Um, I shouldn't try this at home if I were you, yeah. but uh, thank you very much. 
go well, you two. Can you, you make sure he gets home safe? <laughs> Better luck next time. <laughs> Gurley may be a long way from a lot of places, but it's always been a magnet for miners, tourists, blokes off the telly, even soon to be 31st presidents of the USA. In 1897, an engineer called Herbert Hoover came here, charged with lifting mine profits and slashing costs, which he did by cutting wages and bringing in cheap immigrant labor. Typical. Here he is, the cocky little beggar, and this is the Palace Hotel, where he spent a lot of his time while he was in Australia. In fact, an inordinate amount of time. When he finally went home after 10 years, he shipped this back to the Palace, this phenomenally large piece of furniture, a bit like a cinema organ, isn't it? So why did he do it? Well, it may seem a bit odd, but maybe there is an answer, which is that a few years later, this poem was discovered, which allegedly he sent to a barmaid who worked here, who he really fancied. And it goes, Do you ever dream, my sweetheart, of a twilight long ago, of a park in old Kalgoorlie where the Bougainvilliers grow? Actually, we say Bougainvillier because in England we're posher than you. Where the moonbeams on the pathways trace a shimmering brook. This is a lousy poem, isn't it? For a poet, he was a pretty good president. Time for one more stop. It involves a name change, a pink building, and a madam. Interested? This whole street from way up there to down there used to be Brookman Street. But now, as you can see, this little bit is called Hay Street. Why is that? Well, that was the respectable part of Brookman Street. That's where the police station was, for instance. Whereas down here, there were about 20 brothels. Now, this was a bit of a problem for the police because they didn't want to have to admit that there were 20 houses of sin in their street. On the other hand, if they closed them down, then the miners would kick off and would probably riot. So they came up with a brilliant political solution. They changed the name of the street to Hay Street so that from now on, they could put their hands on their hearts and say, there are no whorehouses in Brookman Street. Cuesta Casa is Kalgoorlie's oldest and most famous brothel. It was built over a hundred years ago, and it's the only remaining one which could tell stories from the early gold rush days. Camille. Hi. Hi. How long have you had this place? Since the end of 1992. And you didn't know anything about the industry before no, that? No, no. Presumably, it's quite a good business. Quite lucrative, yes. Are you going to show me around? Certainly, come on. Thank you. Come on in. Yeah. So what have we got here? Oh, wow. This is our bondage room. All sorts of bits and pieces here, aren't there? Yes, yes. OK, this is the burlesque, naughty side of the industry, but historically, it was pretty tough on the girls, wasn't it? It was very tough. The ladies, when they came here to Kalgoorlie, were not allowed off the premises of the place they'd told the police they were going into. She was actually only allowed off the property if she needed medical attention or she was actually on her way out of town and she was off to the bus or the train. So they were just trapped here, really, imprisoned? They were. And there was nowhere for you to shower. There was nowhere for her to shower. There was just a bowl and a jug in the corner of the room for her personal use. It must have got really hot in here. Yes, it does get to 47 degrees here in summertime. As you can see, the, she actually can't wear these anymore because they've actually melted together from the heat God. that we actually have. What was it that happened in 1995 that changed things? This containment policy was relaxed. The state government decided to allow the ladies to actually live away from where they were working. So does that mean that now prostitutes are working out of their own houses and in the streets And the again? motels and hotels yeah. in town, yes. Which was really what the authorities were trying to avoid in the first place. Yes, despite the thousands of men out in the bush who actually had no sex partner. 
You know, she was a necessity for him. And that's still a requirement today? It is. Yeah. It is. Well, thank you for all that. It's so interesting. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'll come again. <laughs> So hands up everyone who thought the only nuggets in Kalgoorlie are under the ground. Changed your mind? Gold towns, by their very nature, tend to grow and then disappear again. But Kalgoorlie has survived and prospered, partly, I suppose, because of the sheer willpower of its people, partly because of the 566 kilometre water pipe, partly because people around here tend to bend the rules when they deem it necessary. But most importantly, because just down there is a zonking great hole, the biggest in the whole of Australia, that still produces billions of dollars worth of gold every year. Hi, I'm Tony Robinson. If you love my show and want to see some more amazing history stories, then please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, and we'll let you know when there's something new to watch. Enjoy.